Hello YouTube, I'm Natanis Likens and today is Thursday, March 14th, 2024. And uh, we're doing our usual thing, so let me uh, pull out of my parking spot and uh, get on with today's subject. So today's subject uh, has been on my mind all night. Um, it's not going to be Minecraft related, it's not going to be permit craft related it's not going to be pokemon related no we are switching gears to a very different uh fandom and that is stargate and stargate sg1 uh we're gonna get very specific here too we are going to be talking specifically about one of the types of enemies and all of Stargate, and I'm not talking just Stargate SG-1, because, uh, they, I mean, I am, but you really can't talk specifics without, like, bringing up other things, um, however, that is not really the reason. My reasoning for this is because I came across an article last night and I was trying to read up on it but I had to just stop because the article was completely incorrect um like hilariously incorrect in my opinion and uh yeah it looks like our camera's gonna be a little bit low but that's okay um so the, the enemy that we are going to be talking about is kind of all-encompassing. It is the Gwauld. Um, so, first off, we need to talk about the movie because the differences in the Gwauld from the movie, which don't even actually technically exist in the movie, um, and the original run of the show, SG-1, uh, are kind of substantial because, and this is one of the things that the article was completely wrong about. Uh, so we we got to cover cover them a little bit. So in in the movie, um, we get introduced to the idea that Raw, this alien, was nearing the end of his life, uh, and he was trying to find a way to prolong it. Now, if you pay attention to the visuals that are presented here, um, Raw is effectively what's known as a gray in these visuals. It, it doesn't flat out state this, but if you pay attention to the visuals that are presented in the movie, he is effectively a gray. Um, and if you don't know what a gray is, where the hell have you been the last 40 years? Okay, they've been a hot, topic in all of anything related to aliens and I don't mean aliens as in xenomorphs I mean like just general aliens and uh, people's belief in aliens and alien abductions anyway um, so he is a gray and he comes to earth and he discovers humans and he quickly realizes that humans are easy to repair their bodies are our bodies are very easy for their technology to repair. Um, now, the movie never states that their technology is anything other than their technology. The show gets a little bit different with it, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, we are focusing on the fact that the camera keeps like falling off. Okay. Um, yeah, go on. So. He effectively takes over the body of a young boy that he finds. And when I say that, I mean literally takes over the body of this boy. Um, he's no longer there and they never really explain how he takes over the body. Because again, in the movie, he is effectively what's known as a gray. Um, there's never anything other than the fact that you know he's a gray they never really state what he is his species or anything it's just kind of 
hinted at with a single visual, okay? Um, so he kid kidnaps this boy and then becomes the raw that we see in the movie and throughout history. Um, and in the show SG-1, up until the body or the actual person dies, um, Raw ends up... I, I do believe that Raw ends up inside of a different body later on and his original body dies. Or they, at that point, they do manage to kill Raw and it, it, the, the host body is just left rotting very quickly. Um, I don't really remember. It's one of those details that kind of escapes me. I've been trying to think of it all night. I don't remember exactly what happens there. Uh, anyway, so this is what the article gets wrong there. The article says that this boy that Raw takes over ends up becoming one of his servants and as a reward he takes the boy's body. No, 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 that is not true at all. Uh, when Raw finds him, he is the only one that comes close to the spaceship and he, he kidnaps him and takes over his body. That is how that story goes in the movie. There is no, he becomes a servant Raw is pleased, Raw takes him over. No, 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 that's not how that works at all in the movie. So that is completely wrong. The next thing that they got wrong in this article had to deal with the defeat of Raw at the end of the movie. So one of the things that you discover in the movie is that Jack O'Neill has been sent there with a nuclear bomb, a very, 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 very small nuclear bomb, mind you, uh, to blow up any kind of threat to Earth. Okay? So, Raw discovers this, and he takes it, and he's going to deliver it with the mineral that they harvest. Um, we don't know what that mineral is until sometime later in SG-1, okay? No idea what it is. Um, the article flat out names it. It is Naquita. If you are familiar with SG-1, that is the mineral that they are harvesting in the first movie, even though they never name it. Um, so he's going to send it back with this Naquita through the, through the Stargate and blow up the Earth because of the rebellion that happened 5,000 years ago. Something like that. I don't remember exactly. Actually, it's probably... It's probably closer to 7,000 years. Eh, maybe. I don't know. I'm really tired, so trying to run the numbers in my head right now is not working too well. Um, so he's going to he's gonna send this nuclear bomb back with that. It should uh, increase the explosive yield of the nuclear bomb by a thousand fold. So th that's significant. It's enough to blow up the earth. Uh, probably not destroy the planet, but definitely kill all the people on it. Um, and there ends up being a race to try and stop the bomb from blowing up and being sent through to earth. Uh, once they do stop that from happening, they quickly find that the bomb, the, uh, the timer on it is still going. There you try to deactivate it, doesn't work. Okay, and this is what the article gets wrong. The article says that Daniel Jackson and Colonel O'Neill send the ball up to Raw's shuttle and activate the bomb. No, 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 no. Raw has rigged the nuclear bomb to explode, period. Okay. They can't stop it from exploding. They don't have control of it. They have completely lost control of it. The only part of it that they have any kind of say with is where the thing is physically located. That's it. Um, that, so that article is completely wrong on that part. Uh, not to mention, it's not Raw's shuttle they're sending it up to. It's the whole flipping... 
a spaceship. Because he takes his spaceship and is fleeing just like he fled Earth from a bunch of primitives with sticks. Okay, that still kind of bugs me in their story, but whatever. Um, so that's the second and technically third thing that that article gets wrong. He's not escaping in a shuttle. Uh, Colonel O'Neill and Daniel Jackson are not purposely blowing him up. I mean, they are, but they do not have physical control over the bomb. Or they, they don't have a way to trigger it. The bomb is going to explode, period, because Rom said it to do that. Um, okay, so now we need to move into SG-1 and uh, talk a little bit more about the Gua'uld. Because this is where the Gua'uld really... This is where they start to be the little parasite that they are. Okay, first thing, the article calls them symbiotes. A symbiote is not a parasite. A symbiote is actually kind of helpful to a person. It is not an evil, dangerous thing. It's actually kind of helpful. Um, like the symbiosis of uh, the birds with, uh, I think it's crocodiles, that uh, eat parasites and, uh, well, just eats parasites out of their teeth. That is not a true symbiotic relationship, but it's beneficial. The, uh, the bird's getting food and the crocodile's getting its teeth cleaned. Okay, that's not a parasite. Uh, the Gua'ud are flat out parasites taking control of their hosts in order to live and do whatever they need to. Um, and it has a beneficial factor of uh, being able to heal the human body of any kind of element. Um, and some physical damage. There is a limit to it, but they can heal some of the physical damage. Uh, and this is where things get kind of convoluted because according to SG-1 and most of what you see, the, the Gua'u don't really need a human body to survive. Um, in fact, you see a couple of them later on that are inside the original host of the Gua'ul, uh, the Yuna or something. You, you only ever see one of these, and it's never implied that this Gua'ul inside this host ever had a problem surviving for however long it's been stuck inside this cave system, um, which is in direct contrast to the movie statement of Ra was looking for a way to prolong his life. He found humans, he took them over, realized that he could easily heal their bodies and thus keep himself alive. Um, very stark contrast there. And there is some similarity to the actual gray ones in SG-1. And they are actually known as the Asgard, as guardians in SG-1. Yes, uh, we are talking about Odin, Thor, and Norse mythology. Um, they are the As Asgards, Asgardians, however you want to say that. That is them. Um, so it definitely seems like the movie version was supposed to be an Asgard that he was inhabiting. Or it is one of the Asgardians himself taking over a human body. Um, there are some things later on in SG-1 that kind of kind of confirms that, but for the most part, the Asgardians are the good guys in SG-1. Um, for the most part, there is Loki, who is not really a villain. He's more of a villain of the moment than an actual villain. Um, we're not going to get into it, but uh, part of their deal is that they do not breed like we would traditionally think of a species breeding. Instead, they their whole race has started to clone themselves and inhabit the new clone body. And this process is starting to break down, um, which does actually fit better with Ra's origin in the movie because he's looking for a new way to prolong his life. 
Uh, their cloning methods have failed, fits a lot better. I think that was probably originally the idea they were going with before they changed it to the Gaul and this little parasite. Uh, I say little, they're not that small. They're actually about the size of a normal snake. And these things are living inside your body. Um, anyway, so... And the Gwauld are not... Okay, so the article states that there are four other uh, villainous things that they have to do deal with. And the Gwauld are the main one. Um, the others being the Wraith, which the Wraith are mostly in Stargate Atlantis. Uh, Stargate Atlantis, I don't think, ever even sees a Gaul, other than the good guys. We're going to talk about them in a minute. Um, then we get the Replicators and the Ori and the Ori's forces. Uh, there's a caveat there that we're going to talk about, because the Ori... The Ori are... Gaul. Uh, we're going to have to get into some confusing stuff in uh, Stargate SG-1 to explain that. Uh, I do... It, it is a very convoluted thing with the Ori because the Ori are effectively Gwa'ul. However, the state that they are in means that they don't have a physical body, so technically they're not the little snake things inhabiting a human. And then, and then we got the replicators, and the replicators are, they're hard to explain. Um, the replicators are a digital creature. They are, they kind of look like a weird robotic cockroach, and these things are not small. They're pretty big, about the size of a small dog. Um, However, it, they're, they're far more complicated than that because they are the result of a robot, an artificial girl, who was just trying to make a friend. Um, and she made the replicators, because she herself is a replicator, technically. She is a replication of whatever she thinks is a pet. I don't... She, she makes them. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but she herself is not a flesh and blood creature. She's a, she's a robot. She's digital. Um, so we got them too. And I really, I forgot where I was going with that originally. So we're just going to backtrack over to the Ori and kind of explain that. Um, but to get into that, we need to talk briefly about... The, uh, the Ancient Ones and Ascension. Okay, so in the movie, it's never implied that all the technology does not belong to Ra. And Ra alone. Let's make that clear. Ra alone. Um, they never allude to any other Egyptian mythological beings as being a real person. Ra is the only one that they allude to. Um, some of his servants, maybe because of the headdresses and armor that they wear. Yeah, maybe, but no. Ra is pretty much the only one in the movie. Uh, they fully expand that and go absolutely crazy with uh, what gods are good guys and what gods are bad guys and what pantheons and I'm saying this because there is one pantheon in the series that is not actually good or evil. They are kind of mixed up, and that's a Thorian pantheon. So Arthur, the uh, Knights of the Round Table, and um, Merlin. Uh, mostly Merlin, but uh, I do believe Morgana at some point makes an appearance. Um, I don't think Mab does, but uh, that gets, they, it's later on in the series, around the time that the actors from Farscape uh, end their series and then come over and start being characters on Stargate. 
Um, it's around that time, and that's about the time that I lose interest in it, because I don't really like that dude. I, have, I never thought he was good in Far Escape, and I didn't really care for him when he joined SG-1. Um, but yeah, so the, the Ascension stuff starts coming into play with the Ancient Ones once they get introduced and we start seeing all these different pantheons and everything. Um, this is the next point that I want to correct from that article. It says that Anubis is defeated by the alliance of uh, the humans and then he ends up ascending. This is not really correct, but it's not really wrong. Uh, he tries to ascend. However, uh, he gets blocked and they kind of lock him in a half ascended, half uh, human form that you never actually see. He just kind of appears as like a misty ethereal thing um, for most of his appearance. And this is from the first time we meet him. Uh, that's how Anubis looks the entire time. It's not he gets defeated and then tries to ascend and comes back. No, 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 no. He, he looks like that the entire time. From the first moment we see him, that's what he looks like. Um, but this starts a whole convoluted thing of the ascension. Um, Daniel Jackson does ascend at one point and is with the Ancient Ones for a little while. Uh, I'm saying Ancient Ones, but they're really just the Ancients. Um, yeah, so there are effectively four types of ascended beings. Okay. The first type is uh, the main one that we see. Like full ascended, they are effectively gods. Uh, that's the main one that we see. And that is effectively all the ancients uh, from the very distant path. The one path? Past. The ones that made all the technology that the Gwaolds use. And I see that the camera is falling. So, yeah, so th that's the ancient ones. That's full ascension where they are basically godlike beings. They don't age. They don't actually need food, even though most of the time we see them, they are sitting at a cafe. Okay, um, if you're familiar with Star Trek, they are effectively Q. Yeah, that's pretty close to exactly what they are. They are effectively Q. Um, now then, the next type is effectively what Anubis is. And that is, he has ascended, but he's not been allowed to ascend all the way. Uh, Anubis is, boy, my voice is cracking. Uh, Anubis is the only one we ever see like this. And uh, there, the, there's a reason why I'm explaining it this way too. Uh, in order to explain the Ori. All right, so we're gonna skip the Ori for now because they're the next type of Ascended that we're gonna talk about. And we are gonna go to the uh, Priors because um, the Priors are not the only ascended humans per se uh, they, they're they partially ascended they are ascended in mind only so that means that they can do uh, feats of magic or really insane uh, feats of strength like they can do some amazing stuff and the reason I wanted to talk about them is because that's what Merlin is uh, he is effectively a partially ascended human. And any any kind of like supernatural or super human being in the in the series 
kind of like that is basically a partially ascended uh, person. It's, it's really hard to explain. You would have to actually watch the series. And then we get to the Ori. And this is why I said that the Ori are effectively Gua'uld. So, the Gua'uld come in a couple of different factions throughout the city, and the Ori is one of those factions. Only all of the Ori, or all of the Gua'uld, that try to ascend, and I am talking about the snake, not the person, in this sense, um, the ancients flat out block and lock them in a partially ascended state that is not the same as Anubis, but is definitely not the same as, whoop, as the, uh, the humans, the partially ascended humans or the ancients themselves. So what effectively happens is the ancients see this happening, realize how evil the Ori are, and think that only pure souls and good people should be allowed to ascend, which is kind of condescending because they don't want any ascended beings interfering with all the mortals. Yeah, go figure. Anyway, so they lock the Ori inside of a device that SG-1 uh, accidentally opens and Hi. Uh, that SG-1 accidentally opens and releases them. And that's what starts the whole uh, portion of the series that deals with the retardedness of the Ori. And I say that because this is also when the Farscape actors come over. Yeah, there's a reason why I didn't watch too much of that and didn't really enjoy it. I didn't enjoy dude coming over from Farscape after it ended. And I didn't really like the story of the Ori. It was very weird. Like, how do you lock an ascended being inside of a piece of technology? And then we get the whole thing with Merlin. And Merlin plays a small role throughout the entire series. Uh, but then we also get this whole thing where Merlin has found a way to work without the ascended beings seeing him in order to work on a weapon to kill ascended beings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's weird. So basically, uh, what I'm saying there is the other part of that article that they get wrong is saying that the Ori is a completely different threat. Um, it is a different scale of threat. It is still the Gua'uld, though. They are still Gua'uld. Um, they're, it's basically the same threat, only this is a much more advanced uh, being because it's ascended, so it's got knowledge and the ability to make technology that is insane, and not to mention priors are... I mean... I don't even really know what to say priors are. Think of a human that has godlike power. Uh, that's the best I can come up with. And uh, I, I say priors, but that's just what the Ori call their priest. Um, again, Merlin is effectively that kind of ascended being uh, where he's got the ability to, to do crazy things. Um, It, it, it gets really convoluted very quickly. Trust me on that. Um, and that's the most... Like, whoever wrote that article clearly never watched the show because, as I say, Raw never chose a servant to take over. No, he flat out kidnapped a kid and took over his body. Um... The, the nuclear bomb that blew up his ship, not his shuttle, was not controlled by 
Colonel O'Neill and Do Dr. Jackson. They didn't have control over it. They just had control of where it physically was before it exploded. And Stupid Raw was still close enough that he, uh, when he tried to escape, they teleported it up to him right as it counted down to zero. So it blew up in his face. Uh, how you survive a nuclear bomb blowing up in your face, I don't know, but he somehow does, and he comes back in uh, Stargate SG-1, though he does later die again. Uh, it's just ridiculous. And he's not even, he, he's kind of, he's, he's there for a little while, but not very long, if I recall correctly. And then the main villain throughout most of it is Apothis. Apothis is the one that we see a whole lot of. And uh, that's the one that they end up dealing with the most. Um, one thing I do want to point out. Uh, when I was reading that article, it, this is not something they got wrong. And the camera just fell again. That's starting to get annoying. I don't know why it's falling constantly. Um, ball. So it, the, the article never states which ball we are talking about. Are we talking about the Norse god? Or are we talking about the Hindu god? Or more correctly, the Buddhist god? Uh, well... If you know anything about the show, most of the Norse gods are actually the good guys. So I would assume that the ball that they are dealing with it, towards the end of the Gwauld phase before they get into the Ori, which is still the Gwauld. Yeah. Um, I, I would assume that that is supposed to be the Buddhist god, Ball, or Bala. Uh, they call him Ball throughout the entire series at that point. However, the pronunciation Ball is actually the Norse god. Bala, I believe. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not that familiar with uh, Buddhist gods. Um, I believe it's Bala is actually the Buddhist one. So they're, they're saying the wrong name. Uh, I do think it is supposed to be the Buddhist god because we do one of the only other pantheon gods that we actually see by name is Shiva, I believe. And again, that is it's either Hindu or Buddhist. I'm not that familiar with Hindu and Buddhist gods, so you, you have to excuse me on that. Um, I'm more familiar with like Roman and Greek than I am even Egyptian or, or Norse. Um, yeah, you'd have to talk to Colonel McDougal about Norse gods. He'll be able to tell you everything about that. But yeah, that's basically what I wanted to talk about today for that. And I am home. Um, yeah, whoever wrote that article, you're an idiot. You clearly have not ever watched the Stargate movie or Stargate SG-1, because you stated so many things incorrectly, and I can't even remember all of them. The the ones that I, I flat out said, hey, if this is incorrect, it's actually this. That's the ones that I actually remember. There was a lot more in there that I was just like, that's not right. Like, why are you saying that? Did you watch any of the show? Like, really? Did you watch it? Because that's not right. Um, but yeah, so if you if you enjoyed Stargate and if there is something I did say incorrectly, um, bear in mind that I am very tired right now. I just worked a 12-hour shift. Anytime I make these videos, I'm just getting off of work. Um, except for occasionally, like, the really short ones is probably me, like, going to work. So, yeah, yeah. Um, there may be some missteps. Like I did say raw, but I'm pretty sure the character I'm thinking about that we see die of old age. I think that's Apothis, actually, not raw. 
I don't remember. I know we see Raw in the series and Raw ends up dying. Uh, I still question how that's even possible if the series is supposed to be the continuation of the movie and the movie literally has Raw being blown up in the face like he is looking at it by a nuclear bomb. I know he comes back because he's he's the main threat and they're they're sitting there looking at him going what the f I thought we blew your ass up uh yeah help me out with that down in the comments leave a comment about that because I'm I'm 90% sure that that's where the series picks up is holy shit Raw's back um I'm 90% sure on that though I am pretty positive that I incorrectly say we watch him die of old age I think that's a pothos that we die at that we watch die of old age or at least his host body dying of old age um very hard to think very 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 tired uh yeah so leave me a comment on that uh correct me if i'm wrong there and uh you know leave a like if you enjoyed hearing me talk about stargate or stargate sg1 and uh, subscribe for more random conversation topics uh, I do want to talk more about nerd stuff and, uh, nerd things, uh, though, yeah, we're, we're just gonna leave it at that. You guys, you know, have a good day, and I will see you later. Bye!